Hi, my name is Dr. Michael Batu, and today we're going to talk about regulating natural monopolies. What do we mean by a natural monopoly? Well, can you give me examples of a natural monopoly? Can you think of an example of a natural monopoly? Well, I can give you one example. Um, utilities, for one. Um, let's say power generation. Only one or very few, possibly two or three firms, can offer this service. Why? Because it's very costly to produce. Imagine setting up a power plant. Imagine setting up a nuclear power plant or, or a dam to, to collect electricity. It's very expensive to do these things. It requires such a scale that only one or two firms can provide. So given the scale that, that's needed to produce these goods and services, uh, it, natural monopolies arise. So, so in other words, monopolies arise naturally in these situations. So by definition, a natural monopoly is an industry characterized by economies of scale that is sufficiently large that only one firm can most efficiently produce this good or service or can most efficiently supply the entire market demand. Now, imagine yourself as a natural monopoly. There's only one firm producing the good or service. So now you have full control on the price that you want to set in that market. And if, if you're a natural monopoly, you will be tempted to raise your price so high because even if you raise your price so high, there's still people who's going to buy that good or service. There's still people who are going to purchase it. So that's where regulation is needed. There are three approaches to regulate a natural monopoly. So you have here three uh, general types of pricing policies for a monopoly. So the first um, pricing is what we call or pricing type is what we call marginal cost pricing. So I will need to sketch a graph to um, illustrate marginal cost pricing, and I'm going to do that graph right here. All right, my friends, so we have here our graph for um, our natural monopoly where we have long run average cost, marginal cost, and demand. Well, what we see here too is that our long run average cost is downward sloping as Q increases. This is uh, specific for a natural monopoly. As the, the monopolies produce more and more of these goods, what happens is that the long run average cost for this firm becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Because as it increases its scale, it becomes more efficient in producing this good. That's why it's a natural monopoly. It, it's efficient in producing this good in large, in, in large quantities. Now, how do we regulate a natural monopoly by way of marginal cost pricing? So the idea is like this. The idea is that the government, for example, would step in and impose a regulation in such a way that price is equal to where MC intersects the demand curve for this good. So it's going to be here. And I will call this marginal cost price as P1. And at P1, this monopolist will, or this natural monopoly, will produce an amount Q1. Now here's the story. Is P1 allocatively efficient? Remember from the previous video, we learned that allocative efficiency requires that marginal cost equal to the marginal value or the price. In this case, marginal cost, uh, uh, marginal cost pricing is allocatively efficient. Why? 
because the price that's set, which is P1, is equal to marginal cost. But my question is this, although it's allocatively efficient, is it good for the natural monopolist? Well, the answer is no, unfortunately. Why is that? At Q1, the cost, the long run cost to produce Q1 is given by C1, which is right here. Okay, and let me label these points point A and point B. Now, at Q1, what is the firm's total revenue? So the total revenue for this natural monopoly is given by zero, Q1, A, and P1. So it's this rectangle right here. So it's zero, Q1, A, P1. Zero, Q1, A, and P1. What about total cost? The total cost to produce Q1 in this case is given by zero, Q1, B, and C1. So zero, Q1, A, I'm sorry, Q1, B, and C1. Clearly, what we see here is that this natural monopoly will incur a loss. And why is that? Well, the total revenue is right here, but its total cost is bigger. And the amount of loss is right here. So this is the loss. So this is not good for the firm. So firm incurs losses. And if you're a regulator, if you're the government, you don't want this firm, this natural monopoly, to leave the market. Why? Because there's only one firm producing this good. So if, if this pr uh, provider decide to leave because uh, it's incurring losses, then there's no other firm to produce that good or service. We don't want that. So what other policy can we uh, come up with? Well, the other policy is what we call average cost pricing. All right. So the second um, type of pricing policy is what we call the average cost pricing. So what do we mean by average cost pricing? What it means is that the regulator or the government would step in and impose a price for this particular good to be equal to the average cost of production. So for instance, if the government set a price, let's say at P2, And the amount of good that will be produced is at, let's say, Q2. Now, we know, we know that the total revenue for the firm in this case, so total revenue, is equal to, and let me add a point here, let me call this point um, C. Okay. So it's going to be 0, Q2, C, and P2. And total cost is equal to 0, Q2, C, and P2. In this case, if the regulator will set the price equal to P2, this natural monopoly will break even. Now, question for you is this. Is P2 allocatively efficient? Well, the answer is no. So it's allocatively inefficient. And why is that? Well, because price is not equal to marginal cost. In fact, our marginal cost is right here for Q2, and P2 is way above that. Since P2 is greater than MC, then it's allocatively inefficient. A third method, so the, the third and last method for um, a pricing policy of this type is what we call a two-part tariff. So a two-part tariff means that um, the government will set a price in such a way that there is a uh, price that's set to acquire that good or service and then if consumers would want more of that good, then they can pay something extra. 
A good example of this would be cable TV. So if uh, we subscribe to cable, uh, we pay basic cable, and on top of the basic cable, we pay, we pay for packages that we like. That's a classic example of a two-part tariff. So we pay a uh, basic cable fee in order for us to have the cable service, and then we pay some more to get the other channel. So that's what we mean by a two-part tariff. So that's, uh, that's it for uh, general types of pricing policies. I hope you enjoy uh, the videos for, for today about pricing policies and see you soon.